Hi, it's good to be with you today. Today we're going to start an introduction to end time prophecy teaching. We really need to be like the men of Issachar who understood the days in which they lived and knew what they should do. Uh, we see how God is moving on the earth today, what's happening in the negative spiritual realm. We know the time is very short and it's important that we understand what we have to get ready for. Jesus said to be ready. And so we're going to start teaching on the sequence of events in the last days in accordance with the Bible. Now, I want to just prepare ourselves before we start. There's a few things I want to say about end time prophecy teaching. There are so many theories out there and it's so confusing that uh, most pastors, if not just about all, have stopped teaching on it because it's hard to sort out all these experts are writing books on it and all these different theories and it gets very confusing. Uh, what I found was uh, that every scripture, if you have the right sequence, every scripture needs to be able to fall in place without us twisting, adding to it, or going to the Greek to change it. Um, and, and I found this problem. So there's so much confusion with prophecy teaching. Um, I was very confused, and God had called me to prepare God's people for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And I was very frustrated with ministry, so I asked the Lord one day, when is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? And he uh, took me to uh, all the scriptures on end times, had me read them all. And one night I was sitting there and he just sort of downloaded it to go here, go here, go here, go here. And it all fell into place and made perfect sense. Now, I had a friend who was uh, pre-trib and uh, most of my generation and, and probably 60% of the people today I've heard still accept this pre-trib theory. So I'm going to speak about that and I'm going to share with you the sequence exactly as how God gave it to me. And I want you to judge the scriptures to see if I'm adding anything to or taking anything away. We're going to have grass. We're going to take it one step at a time and explain the scriptures and uh, they really explain themselves. The problem is if... if um, in the body of Christ, we have our favorite teachers, um, people that stir us up or people that uh, we learn from. And then we get to a point when we don't understand something clearly or we can't see it clearly. We just accept what they say because they do have a lot of wisdom. Uh, and then once we believe something or accept something as truth in our heart, I'm also teaching on the heart and heart issues. We have another series going on that that's going up now. And the two actually go together because the end time prophecy teaching is what we have to get ready for. The teaching on the heart is how we get ready. So the two are really very, very important together. Uh, if we don't know what we have to get ready for, we won't feel the need to get ready, especially in North America where we're spoiled already by the good life that we do have. And so, but it's important, once you believe something in your heart and you've accepted it as truth, whether it's truth or not, then when somebody comes along and teaches something that is contrary to what is already accepted as truth in your heart, your heart rejects it. You can't receive it. You can't accept it because as soon as somebody says something different than what you believe, you automatically go, no, that's not right. And then you can't follow the reasoning of what is being taught. And so this is why there's so many different teachings on prophecy. This is why people, I guess people have tried to figure it out. I know I tried, but I just couldn't get the scriptures to line up until God just downloaded it. And I had a friend who was pre-trib and I, he was a very uh, a mentor to me and uh, he had a very sharp mind and uh, he'd always believed in pre-trib. And uh, as I sat down with him, we got discussing things. And I would say, show me that from the Bible. Where does it say this? This is what it says. You're saying it says this, but this is what I believe it's saying because this is what the scripture says to me. Anyways, he finally saw the point I was making and, and we wrote a book together on it. And so it took us a couple years to get through that. I just didn't get a revelation and start speaking it out. I studied it for two years, made sure that all the scriptures lined up with that revelation. And so we're going to let you judge it for yourself. It's important. You can't believe it just because I say it. You can't believe it because your favorite teacher says it. Now, one thing about prophecy 
is that we have to judge the teaching, not the teacher. These men are teaching what they believe is truth. With all of their heart, they believe that's truth. They would not get up and teach something false. They are good Christians. Um, but we have to judge the teaching, but not the individual. People get upset when they have a favorite teacher, and I say, well, I don't believe the way he's teaching that. And then they get upset with me because they think I'm insulting their teacher, their hero. Well, I'm not insulting him. I'm just judging his teaching. I don't agree with that part of it. Because I have understanding on the heart, I see things differently. Uh, and so they get upset with me. So prophecy should not be controversial, but it is because there's so many different interpretations. But there is a generation that will usher in the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, and much is written to that generation to be ready. I never realized how many scriptures were about the coming of Jesus until I started reading the epistles and the gospels from that perspective in the book of Revelation even the Old Testament, book of Daniel. But even in the epistles, in view of the Lord's coming, this is how we ought to live. They expected Jesus to return uh, at any time. Uh, well, Jesus told them, I'm coming back soon. Well, soon to them uh, meant very soon. <laughs> but Peter said eventually that with the Lord, a, a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day. So just be patient. The same as the, in, in James chapter 5, he says, uh, God is waiting for the harvest of the earth, the same as a farmer waits for the early and the latter rains. So you've heard teaching probably about the latter rain movement. There was an outpouring at the beginning of the church age to get the church started. And the early rain was to get the crop started. And then the latter rain was to bring the crop to maturity for harvest. And so there's another outpouring of the Holy Spirit that is still coming in the last days, greater than it was in the book of Acts, to bring in the harvest and bring in uh, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's going to use the church to do that. But we also have realized from Scripture that wickedness is going to increase in the last days. So we, we have two kingdoms being released on this earth at the same time for the final battle for the souls of mankind. And the church has to rise up now as never before and work together in every region in unity and in purity of heart and train others so that we have people that can handle that great harvest that is coming in. And so Jesus said to be ready. So we need to heed the warnings of the gospel and the epistles in view of his coming. What is written to the seven churches in the book of Revelation is in view of Jesus coming. And some people will say, well, that was taught to those churches at that time. Yes, but it still had to do with the coming of Jesus, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And if we have the same problems than those, church, than those churches had, then we have that problem today that we have to deal with, and Jesus would say the exact same thing to us. Then some people say, well, that covers all the different ages of the church age. Well, uh, and, and certain churches cover a certain church period, but those have been true for all time, for everybody, for every church age, because everybody has had those problems in one form or another. So we have those problems, we need to deal with them. And so it's relevant for us today. But the warnings to the churches are in view of his coming. And so uh, it's important that we heed these warnings and realize what we have to do with them. This is why I said we have to be like the men of Issachar, understand the days we're living and the responsibility that we have. So then the attitude, as I said, the attitude about prophecy there's some people that have a certain prophetic statement, which is a statement of their faith, and you have to believe that to belong to that group, which is ridiculous. You have to believe that Jesus died for your sins to belong to the church. That's it. Uh, there's too much controversy. It's sort of like saying, I'm right, and you better be right like I am, or you can't fellowship with me, which is really quite ridiculous. Um, so we judge the teaching, not the people. And I have heard so many different interpretations of end-time prophecy. Sometimes I think there's as many inter interpretations as there are people teaching it. Um, but prophecy is very, very important. Um, we, we need to, um, when we judge teaching, we're having the right attitude. But if we are judging the people, then our attitude is wrong and we can't receive truth. 
So we have to have a humble heart and prophecy should never bring division. We have to, our love has to be greater than our knowledge. It doesn't matter how right you think you are, your love has to be greater than your knowledge because knowledge puffs up, love edifies or builds up or joins us together and God wants unity in these days also. So just some preliminary things. I was teaching one time and I was teaching my sequence of events and, and afterwards this lady was very upset. Why aren't we taught this in our churches? Why does my pastor teach this? And she was very upset. I said, well, just, just a minute. I know your pastor. He's a good man. God has given me this teaching because of the call that's on my life. Your pastor has great giftings of pastoring and, and looking after people and so forth. He doesn't have to have all the revelation. And so don't get upset with him. And then she calmed down and said, thank you for telling me that because she was upset. She was just that type of character. She wanted truth. And when she heard it, she was upset that it hadn't been taught in her church. Well, this is why the body works together. Everybody have a revelation in a different area, and we have to take it from everybody and have an open heart so that we can keep learning. So it's very important that we understand this. And um, Amos 3 and 7 says, Surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. And God told Daniel, seal up the book until the time of the end, for this is still a long ways off. And he talked about what would happen at the <clears throat> times of the end. I think before God has really released the proper revelation that people have been trying to figure it out and make it fit because as people, we want to uncover a truth that nobody else has uncovered. <laughs> and uh, so we, we want to, but if we're not receiving it from God and all the scriptures don't line up, then we have to question it. All right, so Luke 21, verse 34, uh, I'm going to read there. There's some instructions, very important. We're going to read some other scriptures there afterwards, but it's, Jesus said, Be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life, and that they will close on you unexpectedly like a trap. So the day that he comes, the day that we're waiting for, the day that we're going to receive our glorified bodies, if our hearts are weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and anxieties of life, if we're not living for Jesus, if we don't have a close relationship with him, if we're not uh, purifying our hearts and keeping Jesus alive in our hearts and having that personal relationship there, uh, still having, if we lose our first love, we're getting in trouble. See, this is why the warnings are to the church. They're already saved, but if they don't live the life, then they're not going to be able to deal with the weakness that's coming. And one of the things Jesus said about the last times, the very first thing he said when the apostles asked him about the signs of his coming, he said, watch that you are not deceived. There's going to be a great deception before he comes, a great falling away. The love of many will grow cold, Jesus said. So all of these scriptures have to be taken in context and fit with the sequence of events, which we will do. Uh, and that day will close on you unexpectedly like a trap. If we're not in tune with God, we don't have a close relationship with him, we won't know what's going on. We're, we're not, he's not first place in our life, and so our attention is not on him and, and changing our life and becoming like Christ. And so we won't be able to receive that revelation. For it will come upon all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Jesus also said, those who are faithful through the end will be all right. We keep our faith till the end. Now, we're going to read in Matthew chapter 24, verse 1 said, Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things? He asked. I tell you the truth, no one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. And so the apostles called his attention to the beautiful buildings. See, man is always trying to build something bigger and nicer and better for God. But God's not concerned about buildings. He's concerned about our hearts. And he said, I'll tear this down and rebuild it in three days. He was going to build his church on the rock, who is Jesus Christ and character of Jesus. We've been predestined to be changed into the image of his son. And so it's not about buildings. It's not about how many people. It's not about how big the church is. It's about 
Are we making disciples? Are we becoming like Jesus? That's really the bottom line. So verse 3, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, telling, tell us, they said, when will this happen? Uh, when will one stone not be left on another? When will this temple be destroyed? When will that happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? The sign of the end of the age. So they asked him three questions here, three different questions. First thing Jesus says, watch that, you, that no one deceives you. So important, deception in the last days. We're going to talk more about that. But we're going to go back to Luke chapter 21 again. And Jesus' uh, different parts of his answers are in different parts of the, of the Gospels. But in 21 is quite inclusive. And so I'm going to read uh, Luke 21 verse 5. And we're going to go on <clears throat> to uh, read that chapter. Signs of the end of the age. Some of the disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, as for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Teacher, they asked, when will these things happen and what will the sign that they are about to take place? He replied, watch out that you are not deceived, for many will come in my name claiming I am he. And the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and revolutions, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. So you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. Do not let your heart be troubled. These things have to happen. Know that this is part of God's plan. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There'll be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilence in various places and fearful events and great signs from heaven. This lines up exactly which what he is saying in Matthew, uh, great signs from heaven. So he's talking about the very last days just before he comes. But in verse 12, he says, before all of this, see, he starts at the end. Now he's coming back. He says, before all of this, they will lay hands on you and persecute you. They will deliver you to synagogues and, and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors and all on account of my name. This will result in your being witnesses to them, but make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves, for I will give you words and wisdom that none of you adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. Jesus always had the wisdom to speak to the Pharisees, to the doubters, to the, all the ones, the scribes, all the ones that opposed him. He always had the right words. You will be betrayed even by parents, brothers, relatives, and friends, and they will put some of you to death. All men will hate you because of me, but not a hair of your head will perish. By standing firm, you will gain life. This is true of the end times, but it was also true in the early church. When you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. So now he's going to start to tell them about when the temple is going to be destroyed. And that was in 70 AD, which we know from history. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those in the city get out and let those in the country not enter the city. For this is the time of punishment and fulfillment of all that has been written. How dreadful will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. There will be great distress in the land and wrath against this people. They will fall by the sword and will be taken as prisoners to all nations. Jerusalem, Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So we know that happened in 70 AD. They were dispersed through all the nations because the temple was destroyed uh, and they just were dispersed. At that time, they had been preaching the message. There was great controversy. They were already being killed for their faith. Stephen was stoned to death. We can read that in the book of Acts. And so it was a very dangerous time, but it's going to be similar in Jerusalem in the last days when the Antichrist shows up. Uh, the Antichrist hadn't showed up yet, but see, this is the destruction of the Jerusalem, 70 AD, and it's be before all these other things that he was talking about uh, in the last days. So Jesus is answering three questions here. When, is, when will the temple be destroyed? What's the sign of your coming? And the signs of the end of the age. He started with a sign the end of the age, 
Then he takes them back to what's going to happen shortly. So the problem is that everybody says, well, this is only for the Jews. This is not for the church. Well, it's going to be for the church in the last days. But he was speaking to the Jewish people who were the church <laughs> in those days because they were persecuted because of their faith and what they were doing. There will be signs of the sun and the moon on the earth. Nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring of the tossing of the sea. Now he's getting to the signs of the last days. He said that Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until times of the Gentiles are fulfilled in verse 24. This is the only place in the Bible where I see this scripture that until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled concerning the trampling down of Jerusalem. That's what this is saying. We have to take everything in context with what is being said here. And so from uh, when the Romans were there until 1967, the Jews were never in control of Jerusalem. But in the 1967 war, now they said Jerusalem is ours. Now, people would say, well, they're still not in control. Well, you try and tell them that. They have a government there. They even have Muslims on, on the government. And the city is theirs. It's in their control. They haven't torn the, the Dome of the Rock down because they don't want to start a war. But they are still in control of Jerusalem. And I don't know how anybody can say they're not. And they won that by war. They were attacked. They didn't even go and try and get it. They, they were attacked, and they were just defending themselves. And so uh, God also prophesied in Ezekiel and different places that in the last days he would bring his people back together again. So he has done that. They are now a nation again since 1948.